actual birth of the Portland Woolen Mills occurred in 1896 at Dallas, Oregon. The following year, a new plant was built in the city of Portland. Destroyed by fire in 03, it was rebuilt, remaining in succession to this date in its present location. The raw wool received at the warehouse comes in the form of fleeces packed in bags or bales. The bags varying in weight from 200 to 300 pounds. The bale 500 to 750 pounds. Approximately 70% is western grown. The balance received from various parts of the world. Upon arrival at the warehouse, it is checked for weight and entered in on inventory. The first step in processing grease wool is a sorting of the fleeces. This is done according to fineness, length, and color, which determines the type of fabric to be produced. The next step is a scouring process for purpose of removing impurities from the raw wool. Here the fleeces enter a large hopper. Here the wool enters a scouring machine which consists of four individual bowls. In this process, the wool is moved through the machine by the action of Harrow rakes and passing through a synthetic detergent which cuts the grease from the wool. The shrinkage factor of the wool will vary from 35% on coarse wool to as high as 65% on fine wool, depending upon the amount of natural grease and impurities eliminated during the process. Here, the wool leaves a scouring machine. Entering the stock dryer containing steam pipes, the wool is dried by hot air circulated by means of fans. Upon delivery from the dryer, the wool contains approximately 12% moisture. This percentage is closely maintained in order to prevent the wool from becoming harsh, brittle, or discolored. This bubbling red fountain in the dye house shows the colored liquid being pumped into a large stock dye kettle. The dye to be used is dissolved in water in a separate container and forced under pressure into the stock dye kettle. After loading with wool, the kettle is closed and sealed. The liquid dye is then brought to the boiling point and this temperature maintained for approximately one hour during which period the liquid dye circulates through the wool. When the dyeing cycle is complete, the color will have been absorbed by the wool and a dye bath will no longer contain any color. Removing the dyed wool by hydraulic hoist, a sample is taken and checked for shade. In the mixing department, the different colors or qualities of wool fibers are combined or mixed. Blends are spread in separate layers a few inches in thickness to a mass approximating 2,000 pounds and then fed into the mixing picker. To reduce static electricity and make the fibers pliable, an oil emulsion is applied. Here the truss load blender rotates rapidly, spreading the wool in even layers and further mixing the wool fibers. Here the carding process opens and straightens the wool fibers thoroughly mixing the components of the stock blend for proper spinning into yarn. From an automatic feed hopper, the wool is picked up by a spike apron which removes excess lumps by means of a large comb. The weighing pan determines the size of the yarn and drops it onto a feed apron. The main cylinder and smaller rolls are covered with card wire which contains thousands of sharp points. Picked up by the main cylinder, the wool is carried through the card machine by the rotation of the cylinders. The wool is then taken from the doffer by means of a doffer comb in the form of a web. A small web then carries the wool into the next section of the card where the final carding takes place and enters the doffer in the form of a fine web.
The web is then passed through a pair of grooved rollers containing endless leather tapes. Upon contact with the web, each tape picks up a section of the web and feeds it into the rub aprons and then wound onto spools. In the spinning room, the roving is spun into yarn by means of drawing and twisting. In this room, a battery of 30 spinning frames are engaged in making fancy yarns. Each end of roving is passed through guides, under a large roll, through a twister tube, over drawing rolls, and under a traveler preceding the bobbin, which rotates by the spindle. This operation is called splicing and is done only when an end breaks. This is accomplished by a slight twist of the broken ends. When completely filled with yarn, the operator doffs the bobbin and places empty bobbins on the spindles. This enables the operator to start operation of the frame immediately after completing the doffing of the full bobbins. Each frame contains 120 spindles and each set of yarn spun weighs about 120 pounds. Samples are checked for weight and tensile strength. The warp of the fabric is made in the dressing department where the yarn from the spinning bobbins is transferred to large spools, which is accomplished by the spooler. Yarn leaving the spinning bobbins is wound under compression onto the spools. The spools, completely filled, go to the dressers where the actual warp is made. The spools being positioned on a dressing stand, the operator picks up the required pattern. Before running, each pattern is checked by the foreman of the department and released to be run through the dressing machine and onto the dressing reel in narrow sections. After the warp is put on the reel, it is followed by placing on loom beams which can accommodate as many as 20 pieces at one time. The number of pieces made at one time depends upon the weight of the cloth being made. Here in the tying in room, the harness and the reeds are put on the warp in preparation for weaving. These harnesses control the weave of the cloth and contain many steel heddles with an eyelet in the center of each. This highly precision machine ties up to 300 knots per minute. After spinning, the yarn is transferred to the rewinding department where the yarn is rewound on smaller bobbins which fit into the shuttles of the loom. This machine is completely automatic, ejecting and reloading the bobbins at a rapid rate of speed. In the weaving operation, as the harnesses move, they separate the yarn and allow the shuttle to go across. During this action, one strand of filling yarn is put in place. This is known as a pick. 84 looms such as these are equipped with automatic circuit breakers in case of accidental breakage. By close inspection, all imperfections in the cloth from previous operations are corrected in the burling and mending department. In the event of heavy ends or missing picks, the fabric is mended or removed. The first step in finishing is pre-scouring of the cloth. This operation removes all former oils and foreign material through a series of water baths, detergent, and a 5% solution of sulfuric acid. The cloth is then run through the baker and dryer where it is dried at a temperature of 220 degrees Fahrenheit. Here the soaping tank neutralizes the acid which the cloth contains and returning it to its natural condition. After soaping, the cloth passes through the fulling mills where it is shrunk by means of moisture, friction, and heat. 
In the washing operation, the cloth is run in rope form through hot water and detergent until all soap and foreign matter is removed, after which it is thoroughly rinsed in water. Here the desired color is applied by bath in the dye solution. A solution of hydrogen peroxide is used in the bleaching operation. Excessive water is eliminated by running over the scutcher through hydraulic control rollers. A series of fans propelling steam through the cloth dryer is used to dry the cloth at proper width. Here the wool fibers are gently lifted from the body of the fabric in the napping operation. Fabrics that are not napped go directly from the dryer to the decating machine. In this operation, dry steam is applied, subsequently cooling the cloth, which gives a permanent set to the fabric. Entering the inspection room, the cloth travels over an inspection perch where pattern, color, and imperfections are carefully noted. From the inspection perch, the cloth goes to the roll-up and measuring machine where it is rolled onto tubes, measured for yardage and weighed in ounces per yard. The importance of weighing provides the finishing department a means of controlling excessive shrinkage and proper weight of cloth and other important factors. Leaving the weighing machine, the cloth is sent to the shipping room where it is wrapped in heavy craft paper. Here the name and address of the customer is clearly stenciled on the wrapped roll and is ready for shipment to the customer. This is the Minnesota Wool and Company story from the time the garments are made up until they are shipped on orders to your customers. Here is Minnesota Woolen's main manufacturing plant. Harry Dack and Burley Peterson, who are in charge of this plant, go over some of the production problems. Burley has been in the garment industry for his entire lifespan, and here's a production meeting with Nat going over some of the technical aspects of a new garment. All of the production starts in the cutting room. Palmer Gunderson, the head of the cutting department, lays the pattern. Notice how careful he is. Any slip of the chalk at this point could be very costly. A cutting table after a big cut has been made. Minnesota woolen garments are cut in thousands of units at a time to achieve lower costs, which result in lower selling prices. Here are some of our cutters actually cutting garments out of the material. Notice how many colors in each lay. Any slip of the cutting blade at this point could be very costly. After the garments have been cut, they're stacked in trucks to be taken to the sewing room. One of the bundle boys puts the components on the truck. Next we see the laying up of one of the lining cuts. lining cuts, notice the long expanse of table. From here, the various cuts go to another department where girls sew linings for the jackets. Notice the care she uses, which is prevalent in every operation throughout the plant. Now we move to one of our main operational floors. From this view, we get an idea of the production that is going on in this plant, which has a floor space of 30,000 feet. 
Notice the machines placed all the way back to the windows, a half block long. We move from one operation to another to give you an idea of how the garments are actually made. Minnesota Woolen Company works by the bundle system with each operator very proficient at one particular operation. This girl is making a pocket. Notice again how careful she is. Here's another one of the pocket makers with a different garment. As we go through the plant, you will see many girls who have been with Minnesota Woolen Company up to 40 years. Their know-how combines to make the top quality garments for which Minnesota Woolen Company is famous. This is one of our floor ladies working with an operator on a sewing detail. In this operation, the garment is actually joined together. The machine turns the material under and sews at the same time. Zippers go into one of our jackets. It all looks very simple, but it takes years of know-how to do it correctly. A collar is put on a lady's jacket. note that each operator works on a specific operation and by doing so becomes very, very efficient. This is an interesting operation, the buttonhole machine. It makes the buttonhole and then cuts the opening. There she goes on to another buttonhole. Here she actually sews the button on the garment. Notice how quickly they're sewn on. A marker is chalked on in advance. She knows exactly where each button goes. Now to our finishing section. The garments are taken here and pressed and afterwards checked and inspected to make sure that they come up to the high standards which Minnesota Woolen Company sets. The garment is folded. Later on, it will be shipped over to another building to be shipped on to a customer. Now we move to another floor where Minnesota Woolen Company makes skirts along with some lighter weight jackets. Shown are some of the skirts actually being cut from patterns. As you know, all of these skirts are made in every waist size, one inch apart, and five different skirt lengths for each size, offering up to 60 different sizes for every color skirt. Notice how this machine sews at the same time it pinks the cloth. Now the operator is putting a buttonhole into one of the skirts. All the way, you see the very latest type of equipment for the maximum efficiency and accuracy, which provides the fine workmanship Minnesota Woolen Company garments are famous for. In this operation, after the binding has been attached, the girl hems the skirt to a predetermined length. This is one of the final operations in completing the skirt. Moving along the floor, you will see some of the jackets being created in this section, shorty friscos and jack shirts. Many of our operators are from Europe, all of whom have a vast knowledge and experience in this type of work. background, Burley Peterson is working on some garment patterns with one of our designers. Here is truly precision work, and you might call a designer a garment engineer, because he requires many years of skill and experience.
Now we move to our second factory, plant number two, which is also used for storing the many, many thousands of layaway orders. This is the blouse unit in operation, one of our newest production units with new equipment all the way. A floor lady shows an operator how to solve a unique sewing detail. In this plant, we employ some very skilled operators who have the know-how required for the outstanding blouses you offer your customers. Here's Harold Hand, head designer and creator actually working on one of the new garments he has created. Let's follow it right through the production line to make sure it meets all specifications. Harold is using the Reese buttonholer, the fastest buttonhole machine of its type. Notice how rapidly it sews and what a fine buttonhole it makes. Harold Hand shows the floor lady some of the finer points of this high precision machine. Another operation shows how a girl who keeps repeating an operation becomes more proficient. This results in better made garments at lower prices. This machine is a hemmer. It sews and turns in the hem at the same time. At the finishing operation, after the blouses have been sewn, notice they receive a careful hand pressing that cannot be accomplished by machine. Finally, the latest in our Suzy Q pressing machine, which presses the garment from the inside out and gives it that finished touch. In our main distributing building, a conference of all the key help. Nat is discussing policy with Jerry in charge of merchandise planning. Gordy in charge of advertising and office systems. Sid in charge of the service department. Dick in the sales department, an understudy to Nat. Ed in charge of the bookkeeping department. Gene in charge of our office. Walter in charge of the order department. Ray in charge of our IBM tabulating department. Kenny in charge of the sample department. Chuck is in charge of the shipping department. Here is Hyde, the botliner manager. Henry Heller, overall coordinator of the many departments. Jerry works on some of our detailed merchandising records. Later, you'll see the IBM machine from which Jerry gets the latest statistics. From them, he plans all of our production. Jerry is also in charge of our styling. Here he checks a reversible skirt to make sure it comes up to all of our specifications. Here's Dick, who assists Nat in our sales department. He writes a letter to one of our salespeople. Notice the full-page ad from Life magazine in the background. Of course, here's reliable Sid bringing an inquiry to a final conclusion. Gordy in charge of advertising and office system. He's another of the dependable men, been with the company for well over 25 years. We meet High again, who most of you botliners know is always ready to lend a helping hand.
Nat again with his two sons, Gary and Dick, in a conference. From these meetings, our overall planning and policy begins. They're going over part of our advertising program. Coming into the picture, our legal advisor, Al Weinberg. Following him, Don Wurton and our head auditor. Here are some of our personnel actually starting the work day. Notice them punching the time clock. This group is just the office staff. All of these girls are in the main office. time card was, but she wanted to stay in the picture a little longer. At the end of the line with glasses is Bert, one of our customer service correspondents. Now we take you on a tour through our office. In the foreground, Walter is working in the order department. Back of him, Gene, in charge of the office flow. You'll notice all the way through that we use the very latest equipment. In the bookkeeping department, Ed is in charge. He's working with one of our people. This is one of the very latest Burroughs accounting and bookkeeping machines. See how it operates automatically. Here, a girl in the accounting department is posting botline accounts. Notice again how automatically the machine works for maximum efficiency and speed. The next scene shows us a hand-operated addressograph, which has since been replaced with the very latest electric automatic machine for faster service. As we move into the art department for sales chatter and the botliner, we find one of our artists. We've been told by experts that our work in this type of operation is among the finest in the country. Here the mimeograph machine is shown actually running off a page for sales chatter. Every time you see a different color in sales chatter or the bot liner, it means there's been a different stencil and it is a separate operation which requires much precision to line up the colors. Here's part of the stenographic department using the latest IBM electric typewriter. Jerry is bringing out some information to one of the stenographers to send a telegram. It will be sent on our automatic telefax machine. The telegram is now on the machine and this information is transmitted electronically to Western Union and saves much time. Answers are also transmitted and received in our office the same way. Here's an automatic letter folding machine which folds all of our outgoing letters. Here letters are being sorted into cubbies, so if there are several for one salesman, they're combined in one envelope to save mailing costs. The stuffed envelopes are then run through the postage machine, again pictured as the very latest machine made. It automatically seals and stamps the envelope in one operation. Here's the morning mail coming in as it comes from the post office. It's brought in bags. Mm -hmm. 
order envelopes which come from all over the country. Sack after sack after sack. Normally they're handled one sack at a time, but this was done to give you a little perspective of the tremendous amount there actually is received each day. This machine opens the envelopes. Notice how rapidly they go through how each envelope is slit. After this is done, they go to other girls who sort the orders and the correspondence. The orders then go back to the order department where Walter and his department distribute them for processing before they're sent to the IBM tabulating department. In this operation, they are checked to make sure they are complete and correct. You can see from this how important it is to double check your orders before mailing for faster processing. After the orders have been checked, they are sent to the pullers. These girls actually pull tabulating cards for each item on the order. Every girl is an expert in her section. One might pull cards for just hosiery, another sweaters, another pants, and so forth. The orders pass from one girl to another. Here Walter brings down some more orders to be pulled. And there is a continual stream of orders flowing through this department at all times. After a girl completes the pulling in one section, they pass the cards on to the girls in other sections. After the cards have been pulled, they go to the tabulating room with the orders. Here, Ray, in charge of this section, brings in some of the orders and cards from the pulling section. In this operation, he will separate the orders from the tabulating cards, after which the cards are straightened and put into a tabulating machine. Here, the machine actually computes the cards, and we can tell whether or not the order is correct. Here is a sorting machine, similar to that which you may have seen on the $64,000 question. Notice how rapidly this machine sorts. From this department comes all sales figures, and a trend is set on sales. Every week, we know of each item that has been sold and every bit of production that has been planned. Here we have one of our machine operators checking the tabulating card. After the orders have been run through the tabulating department, they go to the billing department where the girls type the name and address on the labels. Again shown as the very latest in billing machines. Your company continues to use the latest and newest equipment for the best and fastest possible service to your customers. After the orders have been billed, they go to our stuffers. In this operation, the labels and tabulating cards are put together with the order, and from there, they're sent to the shipping department to be filled. Here, sales chatter is being packed for mailing, and this in itself is a separate and large operation. These envelopes are placed into mail bags and rushed to the post office to be mailed to you as quickly as possible. Now let's take a look at our shipping department. This scene shows some of our trunks coming over from the factory, which you saw at the beginning, where the garments are made. Now these great big trunks of merchandise are moved over several times a day from our producing unit to the shipping unit. Here the trunks are being brought in. Soon they'll be opened and the garments taken out to be checked. On the fifth floor of our main building, we see some of the heavier garments, such as jackets and blankets, and orders for these items are being filled.
Now we move to our vast pants and skirt department, which takes up 10,000 feet of space on just this one floor. After the pants orders have been filled, each pair is rechecked to make sure the measurement is right. They've been checked when originally made up, but we again recheck them to make sure that they reach your customer. Your customer wants them the right size. It's just another one of the many precautions taken to ensure the best possible service to your customers. Here's our customer service department. This is not our main factory, but our alteration unit in our main distributing building. The majority of pants are made up in advance in certain sizes according to predetermined production figures, but there is always a certain amount that have to be altered, and when they do, this is the unit which takes care of it. Now we go to one of our main shipping floors. Here's Chuck, in charge of the operation working with Mary, another of our dependable people who has been with us for many years. After the orders have been sorted, they go to the order fillers, and each girl is a specialist in her section. These particular girls fill sweater orders, walking up and down the same aisles all day long. Our orders move, but the fillers remain stationary. They go from one section to another for the fastest possible handling. Here's an order filler in the blouse department. Each girl checks the orders. If there is any item in her department, she fills it. Now the hosiery department. This girl, along with others, fills hosiery items all day long. After the orders have been filled, they go to these checkers. These girls recheck to make sure they've been filled correctly. They make certain the color is right, the size is right, and that every item on the order has been filled. And after they're through, the order is passed on to the wrappers. The wrappers then recount every item to make sure the correct number of items has been filled. In other words, your orders are checked and rechecked before they are shipped. And now, we see an order being wrapped. Notice how carefully she handles the order. After the wrappers have finished the packages, they place them on a conveyor which moves the packages to the postage machine. This conveyor goes all day long without stopping. There's a continual movement of packages. Each one of these girls at the stamp machine is a specialist. One marks in the C numbers, another John from the metered stamp machine, and still another puts on the labels and the COD tags. Notice the stacks of orders in the cubbies, which have already been... Here's our sample department. Each one of these is a line. You will notice each bin is filled with many, many beautiful samples. Kenny, in charge of this department, is checking a full line. Now we have a bot line being filled. You'll notice all samples have been prepared ahead of time so that the orders are received. They're able to ship these samples the very day the order comes in. Here's a line being checked out with every item carefully checked off a packing slip. After they've been checked, they're packed. In this operation, each item is recounted to make sure the number of items being shipped is the same number which has been checked off. Here Kenny shows how the garments are packed in cartons, which we make and assemble ourselves. 
Now for their final lap, the packages are being moved to the post office. They've been coming off in a steady stream from the conveyor, and they're now moving out to our trucks. Here we see the trucks being loaded. This goes on all day long. The truck goes to the post office, and then immediately comes back for another load. There are approximately 75 packages in each of these sacks. Now that the sacks are in, the parcels go in. Some of the trucks going to the post office have only these large parcels in them and others are loaded with just mail sacks. This happens to be a combination truck. This label goes on every package, advertised in life. Now the last of the packages have been put on the truck and it'll move to the main post office. There's always a guard who rides along with the truck to ensure safe delivery of each package to the post office. This is the main Duluth post office. This is a building your company helped to build and it is due to the tremendous volume of business of the Minnesota Woolen Company of which you as a part that we have such a large post office in the city of Duluth. All the scenes you will see from this point were taken in the Duluth post office and show only post office employees. Here you have the packages as they've been moved off. This is a typical shipping day you might see throughout the entire year. It is Christmas every day at the Duluth post office when Minnesota Woolen ships. You see the post office personnel as they work on the packages. Our local post office distributes these packages the same day they come in. Here they're stamped and sorted for various sections of the country. Afterward, these packages are put into piggyback semi-trailers which go right to the train. It is due to our tremendous volume of shipping that the post office here in Duluth has put these piggybacks into use. It is evening. We have shipped so many packages, the post office couldn't get them out during the regular working day, so they've been put on an additional crew, and they're working into the night to get them out to your customers. Here are the last of the packages, ready to go off to the train. This concludes our Minnesota Woolen Company story, from the sheep's back to the garments being worn by your customers. Now scenes from the drawing of winners in your 1959 Salathon. This tremendous promotion enabled more business to be written by every salesperson than any other event in our history. Eight full barrels of entries submitted by hundreds of thousands of customers all over the United States. Minnesota Congressman John Plotnick officiated and made all drawings. Nat Polinski, along with his sons Jerry and Dick, assisted. Before the event, the barrels of entries were rotated and mixed to give each entrant a fair chance. Among the fabulous prizes to customers, six of the much-talked-about General Motors 1960 Corvairs, a 16-foot Magnolia family cruiser with a 35 horsepower Evinrude motor, 15 Parker motorized lawn sweepers, 50 Pfluger 88 spin casting sets. For the salesperson whose customer was awarded the first Corvair, another Corvair, the winner, Bernice Britton of Nebraska. Because her customer placed an order, she received a year's supply of gasoline. In the salesperson's sellathon, the full timer who beat his quota most was awarded the 1960 Deluxe Pontiac station wagon. The winner, Tony Phillips of Nevada, the botliner who topped his quota, won a 1960 Corvair. The winner, Jack Perry of Michigan. Three cash prizes were awarded to full-timers and botliners, plus a Magnolia family cruiser and Evinrude motor, Parker lawn sweepers, and Pfluger spin casting sets. Duluth Mayor Mork and his administrative assistant, M.D. Labradovich, were among civic and business leaders on hand for the drawings. The press, television, and radio were there to record the names of the winners for dissemination throughout the area. This fabulous telethon is the most successful promotion ever attempted by Minnesota Woolen on a national basis, and it's just a forerunner of more wonderful events to come. <laughs>